Today I'm truly delighted to welcome you all uh, in at this Airline Economics Growth Frontiers Asia Pacific Conference. and is starting to spread into Asia. Can you talk to us about the opportunity side? So when you're looking at your customer base or expanding your customer base, what opportunities are you seeing in the market and are they focused on particular geographies? Well, I, I, th I don't think there's any focus. I think there's just a lot, of, a lot of recovery happening. I think Asia is picking up, as you said. And uh, I was here about a month and a half ago and coming back today, the. Uh, the excitement and the energy that's uh, increased is, is quite apparent talking to the same people six weeks later. Um, I think there's lots of opportunity to acquire assets because the airlines have stretched balance sheets. I think it also requires a partnership and a, uh, quite a, uh, a well thought through strategy. Um, we, we certainly have seen significant funding cost increases which are being passed through into the cost of the assets to the underlying operators. Um, so, you know, in, in, in summary, that's where we see our operator opportunity. I think clearly there's competitors of ours that will struggle to finance their businesses or to make sense of their businesses going forward. And I think that will lead to consolidation. Um, at the same time, it leads to new money coming into the business looking for that opportunity, so again, which we see. What in are your optimism life. levels like? How hopeful or worrisome are you for the next 12 months? It's quite hopeful. I, I think we see opportunities and challenges together, but uh, given our size, we don't have legacy issues. You know, uh, everything's clean. So when the opportunity came, we will take it. Robert? I, I think it's sugar and spice. I think there's lots of opportunity, but there, we truly have to be aware of all the inflationary risks, along with the, the strong push to drive us out of this environment and therefore possibly push us too far and drive us into a recession. Can, can, I, can I just pick on that and go, your mood now versus 2019, right? So pre-COVID versus now, if we were having this conversation in Hong Kong in November 2019, you, you, your, your outlook now versus then? I'm more cautious now. I mean, 2019, uh, we, were, we thought there was way too much money in the market, but the fundamentals of the market were fantastic in our, in our mind. The, you know, the airlines were making money, um, people were flying, there was lots of aircraft. We, we were concerned that the OEMs were producing too many aircraft and were going to produce too many aircraft. Uh, today, I think we have different concerns. I think actually by the end of this year, we're going to see a scarcity of narrow bodies, maybe even wide bodies by next year, um, by, the, by the 24 time frame. But the airlines are in a much, much more fragile condition and they are facing a lot of headwinds to get airplanes back up and flying, to get staff trains, pilot shortages, labor demands, logistics. I can, I can go on and on and on. We, don't, we have some very, very amazing airline management teams that know how to run their businesses today. And we, we have to watch them and see how they navigate through a lot of these challenges. David, to give you the final word, or yeah, yeah, or sugar, so, or less. Well, place. I'm always a glass half full person, which I think means I'm optimistic. And uh, I was uh, nervous about the market in two, 2019, so I retired. And uh, a few minutes later, I was working in a very depressed market in COVID. So, uh, you know, we've sort of seen it all in aviation, and we've seen a number of crises. But to answer your question. I think two things that would be, you know, it's the pivot of the Fed, it's how that works out, whether it's in the first quarter 2023. Uh, we don't want to see, because the US is currently the engine driving the world economy and the strong dollar. So we, do, we don't want to see it, you know, catapult into recession because inflation will lag and the Fed gets it wrong. So it's a, that's a very fine balancing act that's going to impact all of our lives, uh, you know, not, not just aviation, actually everything. Well, so and I, I have no doubt whatsoever we're going to be seeing both Airbus and Boeing um, look to significantly increase their wide body production rates, particularly on the 787 and the A350. Uh, so the other thing you have to realize is 
looking globally, the wide-body fleet is older than the single-aisle fleet. Um, if you, in fact, look out in 2023, by the end of 2023, there will be about 2,300 wide bodies that are 25 years of age or older. If you then lower that age threshold to 20 years, you're looking at almost 4,000 units, 3,800 or so, just rough, rough numbers. And so you have um, the replacement cycle even stronger looming and coming um, on the wide body side. Airbus was very public. Christian Share a few weeks ago forecasted that 2025 was going to be a tremendous, uh, by that time, a tremendous surge in, in, in uh, wide body programs and therefore the production rates. Um, and all in the midst of this whole sustainability trend. So these aircraft do need to be replaced. Um, and, and it's a natural lag to the single aisle, but it and is very much happening. Are we seeing changes in the type of investors that are, that are attracted to aviation? And how, how do you feel airline assets compare now to other assets? Ah, it's an excellent question. So basically, uh, in a very low rate environment of, uh, of the 2010 period, uh, we have seen a, a lot of, uh, of a new class of investors, uh, coming uh, and uh, chasing uh, assets uh, related to, uh, to, to aircraft uh, because it was quite a, value, uh, a good value proposal uh, in the context of a very low uh, rate. Now it's true that uh, with uh, inflation and, uh, and interest rate going up, um, there is a competition between, uh, between uh, aircraft asset class uh, and, uh, and over uh, a type of uh, fixed income uh, products, uh, particularly now when uh, we are facing uh, the transition to a low carbon economy, uh, where you have a, a totally new spectrum of infrastructure coming. Okay, uh, so uh, it can be uh, uh, it can be a submarine cable, it can be a gas pipeline. All these products uh, are also yielding uh, a quite generous uh, yield. So now with uh, the low uh, carbon transition, I think that actually uh, aircraft assets uh, are competing with other type of assets that we did not see previously. So yes, there will be, I would say, uh, a changing uh, uh, potential uh, universe of, uh, of buyers, but people uh, who have been comfortable with, uh, with uh, the airline industry and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the aircraft uh, asset will continue to invest in this industry because it's, uh, they know the cycle. And, uh, so, yeah. and to, uh, to conclude on this, at the end of the day, it's a question of access to liquidity. So if uh, uh, the aviation industry as a whole doesn't take that topic uh, seriously, access to liquidity will shrink. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you know the, and you know the, 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 the next step uh, when liquidity is shrinking because investors, banks, uh, uh, more and more will be here to uh, accompany the one transitioning. But if one sector does not transition, it will be a real challenge. I think we will need uh, about 300 to 400 sustainable aviation fuel plant by 2030. And we are not eating that number today.